Good morning, greetings to the brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, thank God for giving us another day to worship and thank the Lord for his goodness that we are found again in its course. Okay. So before we start uh, and uh, submit our hearts for worship, let's read from the book of Psalms chapter 116, verses 12 to 13, please. Psalms 116, verses 12 to 13, yes. This is a familiar portion. Um, it says, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Let's look to the Lord for his guidance. Loving Heavenly Father, gracious, mighty God, Lord, come before thy throne of grace, Lord. This morning time, Lord, with a humble heart, seeking for your guidance, Lord, and wisdom, Lord, I acknowledge that uh, I am nothing. I stand before you. Just we are a speck of dust, Lord, but yet you have given us the opportunity to be present among the land of the living and come before the courts. Lord, as uh, I uh, uh, share and uh, meditate on your word, give us uh, the grace um, and uh, give open the hearts of everyone present here and whoever's listening online as well, that they, they might receive this word with great understanding and let them be let them understand it and bring glory to your name. Lord, it is not that, uh, it is nothing in me. Lord, I'm just an empty vessel, Lord. Fill me with your spirit and let your words come out, oh Lord. Nothing that's in me, that is good. But only through you uh, we have all the power and the knowledge. Um, I ask all of this in the precious and majesty name of my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We know this familiar portion. We have uh, read this many times, and uh, we've also prayed this prayer during our worship, right? And I, myself, since childhood, I've always, I've listened to my dad, who always prayed this prayer, that he lifts up his cup of salvation and offers it in the name of the Lord, right? And do any of you uh, present here, do you know where this origin of Cup of Salvation has come from? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, yes, that, uh, this is uh, also from the beginning, yes. And any more, any specific uh, answers? It's okay. Uh, today we are going to look into that history of the cup of salvation, how it originated, and also the different cups that are in the Bible. And we'll look at a few of them, not every cup, because uh, keeping the time in hand. Um, let us, uh, so to start with, um, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 6 verses 6 to 7. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. So, this is the promise that the Lord, uh, the Father, had given to Moses to give that to all the Israelites before they were brought out of the land of Egypt. So, this, in remembrance of this, the 
Israelites or the Jews, they, they celebrate the Passover. We all know the story of the Passover, right? Where God had redeemed, delivered all of the uh, Israelites from the bondage of Egypt. So this is, these two verses, we're going to delve into each, each part of it, which symbolizes um, these cups. So there are four cups that are consumed during the Passover festival, or they call it seder. So these four cups signify a lot of important um, history and also significance that uh, Jews or Israelites hold in their Passover uh, time. So out of these four cups, the first cup is called the cup of sanctification. It's also called a dish. And this cup is from the first uh, part of the verse 6, which is, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So the word sanctification means that he is putting the children of Israel separate they were set apart for a purpose. They were chosen. The Lord is reminding the children of Israel that he has set them apart from all nations of the world, from the Egyptians, and he's calling them his people. And he's, he's promising them that he will bring them out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So they, we all know that they have faced so much hardship by the Egyptians, right? For 400 years, they have been facing this hardships. And God is promising the Israelites that they will be brought from out of that yoke of bondage. And that is the cup of sanctification. That's the first cup that they drink. So this cup signifies for us, what it reminds us is that the Lord sanctified us as, as a separate people, right? All those who believe in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have been set apart. We have been sanctified. We have been chosen. We are not like the Gentiles or the unbelievers who do not believe or who do not have the faith that the Lord has died for our sins and rose again, right? We are believers. We have been chosen. We have been set apart. So this cup signifies the cup of sanctification. If we read from Hebrews 10.10, 10, it says, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We also can read Isaiah 42.6, which says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Here, God is not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to us. He's giving a covenant to his people. And he's saying he will keep us as the light to the Gentiles. We've got to remember that, children of God. And in Acts 13, 47... God says, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. All the way from Old Testament, Isaiah, to the Acts of Apostles, we see that he's setting us as the light to the Gentiles, right? We have to remember that. This cup of... Uh, Sanctification reminds us of that. Now, let's look into the second cup. The second cup is called the cup of deliverance or the cup of praise, some call it. So this cup is taken out of the word, I will free you out of their bondage. The Israelites were not just delivered, were not just chosen or put sanctified, put apart from the rest of the Egyptians, but they were also 
brought out of their bondage. What bondage did they have? They were not, they were not free to do anything they want, right? They were, not, they were bound by the rules of the Egyptians. They had cruel hardships. They had to endure and they had to follow the laws of that Egypt, right? But the Lord had brought them out, out of their bondage. <coughs> this cup signifies and reminds us how the Lord has redeemed us from our bondage. You know, what bondage did we have? Louder. Correct. We were bound in the bondage of sin. We were all, right? We were born into sin. And we were bound in this sin. But Lord has delivered us from out of this bondage. He did not give us, he did not put us into restriction. He has brought us into life and he has took away that bondage of sin. Correct? And if we read Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Such a wonderful verse. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. This bondage, this evil world that is full of sin, he has delivered us. That is the cup of deliverance or praise that they take part in. This is what the Lord reminds us of this cup. Now, the third cup, this is a very important cup. The third cup is called the cup of redemption, or some of them call it the cup of blessing. The, this is the part of the verse where the Lord redeemed the Israelites out with a strong and outstretched arm. We see that at the uh, the last part of uh, verse 6 in chapter 6 of Exodus. It says, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Right? He has redeemed the children of Israel out of that bondage of that sin and of that. And this verse or this symbolizes not just the redemption, but also the power of God. It says, which a stretched out arm. When do you stretch out your arm? When you, are, when you have a purpose, when you, when you want to do, when you want to fulfill that with a strong hand, right? So that's, that is what a stretched out, that is what the Lord had done. He brought them out with, with all, we've seen the 10, uh, we've read about the 10 plagues. And that these 10 plagues were not just caused by mere natural causes, right? The Lord brought those plagues onto the Egyptians, but the Israelites were not affected. Such a great, powerful God is the God who we worship, right? And in this, this cup also symbolizes that the blood that was shed for the Passover, which we all call the Passover lamb that was slain, where the lamb without a blemish, without a spot was taken, was its blood was taken and put on the doorposts of their house so that death <coughs> did not come to their, to their dwelling. You know, that, that lamb that was slain, that blood that was shed, reminds us of the blood of Jesus who died on that cross of Calvary for our sins. That blood that was shed by a blemishless, a spotless son of God who didn't have any sin in him, right? He was blameless. He was perfect. He was, he was the most perfect person in this whole world from before or after. And this God was slain. He took upon himself that blame that was supposed to be on us. This is what this cup reminds us all of. It's, it symbolizes the Lord's sacrifice. And 
This cup is also the cup that is set before us. The, when we take part in the table, this is the cup of redemption that the Lord is talking about. If we, uh, if we see, if we read Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, said the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After these days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, said the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. You know what this, these few verses remind us of? Of, his, of the Lord Jesus' sacrifice on that cross of Calvary that he died for our sins, taking away all the iniquity and forgiving us whoever asks for that forgiveness, right? And we read, we can also read from Matthew 26, verse 27 to 28, that the Lord himself, Lord Jesus himself, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is, the, is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is the last Passover meal that the Lord was taking part of with his disciples. And he, Jesus is talking the New Testament that is mentioned, the new covenant that is mentioned in Jeremiah 31 was fulfilled by the Lord Jesus in this verse where he says, uh, verse 28, for this is my blood of the new testament which is shared for many for the remission of sins. Jesus here is equating his blood to the blood of the Passover lamb that was slain uh, during the first Passover. This fulfills the promise that was written that uh, he will give us a new covenant. This was the culmination or the connection of centuries of tradition. Can you imagine what uh, all, the, all his disciples who were Jews, they knew. They have taken part in many Passovers throughout their entire life. Yet, when they heard of this, they should have been rejoicing, right? They were rejoiced that the Lord fulfilled the promise that was mentioned in Jeremiah 31 with a new covenant by his blood that was shed. And such is the significance of the cup we take part of. Every Sunday, we come here, right? And uh, uh, Ebiana and Jonana, when they pray and they ask us to examine ourselves in the light of the word, and they don't say it lightly. It is such a high significance and is such a solemn time that we have to examine ourselves and take part in that blood. That blood was not shed just for any cause. It was shed to give us a new covenant, a new testament that we might be saved and we might be brought into his fold, right? And it says, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God, the Lord promised the Israelites, right? And if you look into 1 Corinthians 11, 28, we read this, right? We need to examine ourselves thoroughly before we take part in this cup that is set before us, this cup of redemption. And the fourth cup, the last cup, is the cup of restoration or anticipation. This cup it symbolizes God's uh, 
promise to them that they will be called their people and children. The Lord promised the Israelites that they had to be chosen to be called his people, right? He didn't, he promised Abraham that his generations are going to be like the sands of the sea. The, no, the countless number of stars is how many his generations are going to be. Right? <laughs> we can see that Israelites and the Jews, they take part in this. And they, they are, they are uh, taking part in this, thinking, yes, the Messiah will come. That is the cup of anticipation where they are still waiting for the Messiah. But we already have Jesus Christ who came into this world, who died for our sins. And if we read Matthew 26, 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the wine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This cup also symbolizes in certain uh, customs, this cup of anticipation or uh, restoration. This cup is also offered by the groom to the bride. And here we read that, if we read Matthew 26, chapter 26, we see that that is the last supper that the Lord was taking part of with his disciples. And here we read from the previous verses that the Lord gave thanks, took the cup, and he gave his blood as a New Testament. Now, here he says, the Lord says in 29 that he's not going to take part of it. You know why? Because this cup symbolizes the cup that we are all going to take part in the Father's kingdom. When the Lord is coming, going to come back, he's going to take us all with him to heaven, and that's when we'll take part in this cup with the Lord. That is the significance of this cup, where God promised each of us that whoever's, whoever believes in him, whoever asks for his forgiveness and believes that he has died and rose again, and we, whoever believes in the Lord Jesus, he will be saved, right? And whoever is taken up into heaven, they will all take part we, we, as a church, are the bride for the Lord, right? And the groom, the Lord, is telling us that he is going to offer this cup in his Father's kingdom to all of us. This is the time we need to examine ourselves. How many of us are ready to take part when the Lord comes back? When the Lord comes back anew with power and glory, and takes us all up into heaven. Will we be left behind, or will we be in heaven taking part of his, taking part with him in that cup? Now, in conclusion, I'd like to draw your attention to the word from David, Psalms 116, where he mentions the cup of salvation. Now I have given all f different four cups that is taking part in Passover, but I did not mention the cup of salvation because David he he did he he followed all of this custom, so he knew all, the significance all of, of all the cups. When he talks about the cup of salvation, he is combining the cup of sanctification and the cup of deliverance, both of these cups together are the cup of salvation. You know what this signifies to us? He's not just, signif he's not just taking us, he's not giving us salvation. He's not just sanctifying us, he's not delivering us, but he's giving us salvation unto life, right? And we all know that whoever has taken part, whoever has believed and accepted Jesus Christ, we all have received salvation, right? And David 
is talking about that cup of, when we say that we lift up our cup of salvation, this is signifying that we have been set apart. We have, the, we, we recognize, we acknowledge that the Lord set us apart from the sinners. And he has delivered us from that bondage of sin. That is the significance of the cup of salvation. And if we read from Jeremiah 25, 15, it says, For thus said the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. You know what this cup is? This is the cup of wrath that is mentioned in the Bible. Also, it's mentioned in Revelations. We'll, uh, uh, we'll look at it um, in another time. But this cup of wrath, this cup of wrath was taken by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? He took that cup when, when he went right before his crucifixion and his betrayal, when the Lord went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and when he prayed, he prayed to the Father. He said, Father, take this cup from me, if it is your will and not mine. By taking that cup of wrath on himself, he has given us that cup of salvation. That is the important significance that we need to remember today. This is what I wanted to bring all of you to understand that when we say the words, we lift up our cup of salvation. That is the significance of our words. Are we saying it out of mere words? Is it just our mouth that is giving out that praise? Or are we convicted in our hearts? Do we know the true importance of that cup of salvation that David was mentioning about? We need to examine ourselves, brothers and sisters, in the Lord. And we need to remember that Christ has taken that sacrifice, that cup of wrath on himself so that he gave, gave us eternal life unto salvation. And that is who, the, uh, who we worship. So with that thought, I would ask everyone to take part in worship by examining ourselves and offering the truth and offer a worship in spirit and in truth. Thank you.